This happened to me around 30 years ago, back when I was just a child. I've never felt comfortable talking about this, as traumatic as it was for me, but I think it's beyond time I let this off of my chest. It's up to you if you want to believe this or not, I, now I'm used to people thinking I'm all kinds of crazy. So, back in the late 80s, before the Babri Mosque had been demolished, my family was living comfortably in a small town in central India. This was before the internet. Well, our family couldn't even afford a television, so the only entertainment we had as kids was other kids. As it goes for small towns like ours, almost everyone knew everyone else, and we always had a large group of kids to play with. By far our most favourite activity was playing cricket, as it was and continues to be for most South Asian kids. Every week we'd each get 10 rupees, with the condition being that the losing team had to pool its money and treat the winners. It added stakes to our matches, and even led to fights, but it sure was something to look forward to each Sunday. My father was against this, arguing that it teaches kids to gamble, so I had to sneak off to my much more soft-hearted mum to pay my share. So, on every Sunday at around 4pm, I would take my cricket bat, strap it to the back of my cycle, and ride to the playground. Our cricket field was just a wide open space next to a seldom used basketball court, about two to three kilometres away from my house. My parents aren't particularly irresponsible, so it's still a wonder to me that I was allowed to go all that way at such a young age. The little playground was oddly positioned. The only buildings near it were an old post office and some abandoned houses. If it hadn't been for us kids, our town would have just forgotten about that area. The streetlights on the road nearby were the only artificial source of light there, so believe me when I say this. When it got dark, it would get very creepy and none of us liked to stay there after sunset. It was a Sunday like any other. After a lot of begging and pleading, I convinced my mother to give me the money and happily ridden my bike to the field. I remember being one of the first ones to arrive that day, setting up the stumps and impatiently waiting for the others. There were about twenty of us, all from different socio-economic and religious backgrounds, all united by boredom and cricket. I would never have such a diverse group of friends ever again in my life, especially with what happened in Ayodhya a couple of years later. Well, we won the match that day, and I remember playing exceptionally well myself. The sun had started to go down, the sky was a sickly shade of orange, and we were chatting about the match and deciding where to go for the treat when I felt an intense urge to pee. Asking my friends to wait for me, I decided to go relieve myself on the walls of the old post office. Yes, I had terrible civic sense back then. As I unzipped my pants, I could hear them laughing and going away, thinking it would be hilarious to leave me in the dark. I quickly did my business, zipped up my pants and turned around, ready to leave. And that's when I saw him. He was standing next to a bicycle, with a wall of cotton candy behind him, somehow attached to his cycle. His face was tilted to the left, and he had this strangest squint, with both of his eyes pushing painfully rightward, such that his pupils were just tiny black specks in the white expanse of his eyes. He had a very dry mouth that pushed inward, as if he was an old man without any teeth, which was bizarre since he clearly looked very young. I stood frozen to the spot as I saw him, unable to believe what I was looking at. The next second, my heart jumped as he rang the bell on his bicycle. Tring, tring, tring. Well, the hair on the back of my neck stood up. Imagine you're all alone in the middle of an empty field and a strange, squinty-eyed man with his head tilted to the side is standing in front of you, ringing the bell on his bicycle, while not even looking at you. Tring, tring, tring. Tring, tring, tring in short bursts of three. Tring, tring, tring. My brain tried to rationalise it. Maybe he was just a candy seller, banging in the middle of an empty, dark playground with no one here but the two of us. My parents had always warned me about strangers who tried to kidnap kids by giving them poison candy. This was much more terrifying than that. After a short while, I gathered up what little courage I had. What? What do you want? I asked, my voice much more lower pitched than it, what it usually was. At that he stopped ringing the bell, and for a few moments the both of us stood motionless, in complete silence. Then, suddenly, his face jerked into a straight position, 
and his pupils moved to the centre of his eyes, focusing all his attention on me. Tring, 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 he whispered, his soft voice still sounding loud and clear in my ears. Tring, 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 tring. His mouth turned into the most frightening, toothless smile I had ever seen as he kept on whispering. Tring, tring, tring. Tring, tring, tring. All rational thought fled my body as I just ran from there, forgetting everything. I forgot that I'd left my bike back there, forgot where I was running to. I just ran, with survival the only thing on my brain. I didn't know how I knew it, but I knew that if I delayed running by even a second, I was certain to die. Pain exploded in my legs as my feet pounded the ground, desperate as I was to flee from this situation. I was screaming and crying as I ran, not looking behind me, yet somehow knowing he was right on my heels. My fears were confirmed when I heard him whisper, right next to my ears, Tring, tring, tring. Tring, tring, tring. I stumbled and fell. Fear and hopelessness took over my body. I felt like a cornered animal who knew he was about to be hunted by a predator. Reluctantly, I looked around and saw that he wasn't anywhere close to me. He was still standing there, staring at the spot where I'd stood just a moment ago. I didn't stick around to see what would happen next and ran from there, only stopping at the front door of my house, where I collapsed in exhaustion. My mother herself was scared out of her wits when she found me on the doorstep, reduced to a blubbering mess. Through my tears, I tried explaining what had happened, not knowing how much she understood. I would find out later that my parents thought someone was trying to kidnap me. Oh, if only it was something that rational. My army hugged me, and I finally calmed down. Even my older sister, Fatima, was sympathetic towards me for once. That evening, my Abu went out and got my bicycle back. He was furious at me that I was going out and playing cricket using money, that I was going all the way there alone, even though he'd never objected to that before, but, most of all, furious that he'd almost lost me. He took me to the police station to file a complaint, but the cops weren't interested. We came from an underprivileged family, and I hadn't even been hurt in any way, so they pretty much run us out of the station. That night, I lay in bed with my eyes wide open. I'd seen far too much that day to sleep comfortably. I don't know how much time had passed, with me just staring at the ceiling, when I heard that scarily familiar sound again. Tring, tring, tring. Tring, tring, tring. It was, unmistakably, the sound of that god-awful bell again, this time coming from right outside my bedroom. I closed my eyes, pulled my blanket above my head, pretending that I hadn't heard anything. The sound continued for what felt like hours, finally ceasing after I refused to take the bait. It had been a good while after the sound of the bell had stopped, when I peeked out of the blanket after pulling the curtains aside. He was still there, silently standing next to his bike, his spindly body being illuminated by the moonlight. Face tilted, eyes squinting to the right. He was as frightening as I remembered him to be. He must have sensed me, because as soon as I saw him, he started ringing the bell again. I shivered in fear and began calling for my sister, making sure to keep my voice down to a whisper. Fatima! I said urgently, Fatima, wake up. She didn't move. Please, I said, my voice cracking. The bell continued to ring. She slowly, slowly, she slowly began to stir in her bed, and the ringing immediately stopped. She yawned and looked at me. What happened? Her eyes beginning to widen as she saw fear. Oh, come on. Her eyes beginning to widen as she saw the fear in my eyes. It's him, I whispered, tears running down my face. He's outside. She immediately jerked upright and pulled aside the curtains. There was no one there. 
There's no one, she said, looking at me suspiciously. Go back to sleep. I immediately knew that she didn't believe me, and that she thought I was making it all up, including what I said had happened earlier in the evening. She pulled the curtains back and went off to sleep again. She might not have believed me, but I knew it was real. I was alert as I'd ever been, straining my ears for the sound of the bell, but it wouldn't come again that night. I checked my watch. It was 3am and I needed to pee. I tried to hold it in for as long as I could, but the time came and I just had to go. There was no way I was going to wet the bed, even as scared as I was. After my bladder became intolerable, I decided to brave the journey to the bathroom. As I got to the bathroom door, I immediately knew that something was wrong. I could feel this presence inside, and I knew that I should have walked away then and there. But I pushed the door open with trembling hands, and my hunch was proven correct. I saw a figure in the dark corner, his back turned towards me. Even though I couldn't see him, I knew who he was. He began to furiously whisper, his soft voice sounding like it was coming from right next to me. Tring, tring, tring. Tring, tring, tring. I screamed with all my might and fell backwards. He turned, his eyes shining as they focused on me, and he gave me that fucked up smile of his. I began to crawl backwards, screaming my lungs out. I soon felt arms around me and jumped, thinking that he got to me, but no. It was Fatima. She was looking at him, her eyes wide in fear as she realized that I was speaking the truth all along. Go get up, she screamed, and I got up and ran. The last thing I saw was Fatima trying to close the bathroom door before I was out of the room and ran into the solid frame of my father. He pushed me aside and walked into our bedroom. I didn't stop running until I found my mother and quickly wrapped myself around her legs, crying hysterically. She began to comfort me, running her hand through my hair. Just when I thought the madness was coming to an end, my father let out a yell, full of such anguish that I had never heard in his voice before, or ever would again. Army quickly walked to our room, with me following closely behind, albeit a little reluctantly. She too let out a painful scream as she entered the room, and I understood why. What I saw there chilled me to the bone, and has haunted me to this day. Fatima's lifeless body was lying on her bed, with large tufts of cotton candy sticking out of her mouth. Hey there, thank you so much for taking the time to drop by and listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me. I put a lot of time and effort into making these videos, so it's nice to know that there's someone out there listening. Do me a little favor, would you? Click that like button, leave a comment, and if you really feel like it, why not subscribe too? Okay, happy tales everyone. See you soon.